Good morning, all. Welcome to DNS Operations. I know it's early. I'm Tim, and of course we have a busy we have a busy thing. What? I have to be louder. Okay. So we're in DNS Ops. So everybody remotely actually should be aware of that. Um, the usual stuff. Um, change the Jabber scribe. Paul Hoffman's taking note minutes, and I thank we thank you both for that. Um, you should know the note well, it's, and you should note it well. Um, the agenda's kind of free flowing. We had to make a last minute change to move. There's a discussion about 6761, which I know you're all dying to talk about. We had to move it up for, for Ralph due to some time constraints on his part. So um, we'll, we're trying to, but we have a hard limit on that because you know we can talk for three weeks on that topic. Right. So, Paul Vargas. Um, so, yes. So, I don't think that that discussion needs to happen here all the time. We've, this is no. not going to be the third time we're having this discussion yes. here. And no. we always run out of time. And now yes. you've even moved to the beginning of the agenda. So, well, so we'll, we'll, that's different from saying, if we have time, we'll talk about this because it doesn't really belong here to begin with. And now it's like, oh, we're going to run out of time. Uh, and we've just talked, you know. In, oh, no. This is more discussion. to talk about the design team. And, and sort of what they're looking to... Hold on a second. Okay. You said it doesn't belong here? Because it does. I put it on the charter for a reason. <laughs> like, where else does it belong? I, Maybe I, I can? I, I don't think, know. I think what, uh, no. No, it does not. Thank you. Sit down. Well, I think what Paul's saying is we shouldn't do this every time, right? And I think, you know, this, that's not really going to be the case. But I understand your your pain. Um, so on some document updates, on some document updates, since Prague, we've, um, we've got three RFCs published, including that wonderful dot onion that we all um, were crazy about, but also negative trust anchors, which was a great thing and key timing. We finally um, got Stephen Morris to finish his final edits and we got key timing done. So we were very psyched about that. And in the RFC editor queue, we have DNS terminology and root loopback. Um, and we literally have 
is that six documents that we just we've dumped on Joel. So we've basically done AD overload. Um, they've all gone through last call. We've done all the write ups. We've pushed all the buttons. And so um, he'll move that he'll move those through. And right now in working in the group last call, we started off, I started off the chain query. Um, and so if there's anybody here who had any sort of complaints about it in any sort of large scale, they should get up at the mic and speak now. And we adopted, um, which was something we started in Hawaii was the Lee Howard thing on IP6 stuff. Um, and, and actually, um, the only other diet, there's two other documents waiting in the, in the queue and that's all TLD. Um, which you can talk to Joel about, and the DNS roadblock avoidance, which we're actually going to talk about briefly here. You want to speak your mind? Okay. This is yeah, I guess so. It would be nice to have some clarity on what's actually happening with Alt TLD. Um, the authors asked for working group last call on September 14th, and we never heard back. We're fine to be told it's waiting, just it would be nice to know what's actually going yeah. on. I think you were just told it's waiting. If that's yeah, if that's if that's the official thing, then yeah, we can we can do that. Joel, is that the official thing? He sort of, you know, okay. I say it is. Okay. The the larger, more you know, time-consuming sixty-seven, sixty-one discussion. Okay. Um, the 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 thing that yes. Um. The proposal, Joel Yeagley again, um, a proposal um, for a sandbox that's safe to play in should be considered in the context of the larger problem. So um, it's a piece in the puzzle, and I think we probably need to engage in some more haste necessarily than we have in the past, but we had a lot of pieces in flight between this meeting or the previous meeting and this one. And so I think we need to um, um, think pretty hard about um, the problem and um, how a proposal like dot alt um, fits into that. Yeah. Is that, is that, okay, is that good? Yeah. Um, and as I was sitting down with um, Paul Hoffman as secretary yesterday going through the list of documents, we realized as we dumped all this stuff on Joel, we, you know, there was a void there, right? And IETF of course a vacuum. So we, I picked out things that have had lots of, dis has had discussion on the mailing list that looking forward, these aren't adopted, you know, but things that we may end up start talking about going in the, in the next year. So just to sort of get your head, you know, as, as places where we can sort of start these sort of conversations. Um, the last one, um, Tony Finch asked me to sort of make a comment about it. He wants to revise 2371. Um, and, and so he had published a, a, a biz version. And I know there's been some feedback on the mailing list. And so we're gonna, he just wanted to sort of let people know that um, he's looking to, to, to rev that. So, and a few of these that we talked about today actually. Um, but other stuff may become available as well as we find crazy cool stuff, who knows. Mark Andrews asking in Jabber about draft Andrews DNS no response issue. The, uh, graph the DNS no, no response. Oh, his no response draft. I can take that. So that one, I've, I've that one that one has been through several revisions, has been offered on the working group list several times, hasn't been discussed recently. Um, and there was the last time that Mark brought that to the working group, there were some very clear suggestions for revisions that um, I don't know if those revisions have been made. So if Mark could clarify that those revisions had been made, he's welcome to bring the, the document back to the group. There's, there's a good operational portion of that document that he, you know, is very great. And, and then there's a, a part that um, while I understand where Mark's coming from, it, it's, it's trying to for, enforce policy on some level that we aren't, DNS op should, you know, we shouldn't be in the business of doing that. Um, and I've talked to Mark about that, and, and I would love to see if we can cut out the pieces and, and put together a good operational draft because he's got, he definitely has done some good work in there. Um, so of course you guys make the decisions. So if you're interested in what we're thinking about or what we're working on, there's the list of documents.
that Paul Hoffman sort of maintains as secretary, and, and I definitely have to thank him for keeping me sort of honest on a regular basis as to what we're doing, because there are lots of things in flight, as you know, and trying to make sure we actually cover everything, we don't let things slip, um, which I've been guilty of. The one thing that's in the queue is this DNS roadblock avoidance, and we, I've talked with Oliver and Wes, and basically it's ready for working group last call. There's this one issue where the authors punted on a problem um, and they sent an email to the list back in July and they, want, they were looking for some guidance from the group as to what to do with it, basically. And, and we can just start working group last call without that because I do think there's enough, that we have three implementations now, I believe, of the roadblock avoidance code, including uh, a version that the NL Labs guys did over the weekend during the hackathon. Um, I've got the slides in there, so nobody has opinions. Okay, so um, maybe I can get a hum of the room. Okay, oh, Wes, one of the authors. Well, yeah, just, just to clarify, this is Wes Hardiger. Um, the document's very good as is. There was one sort of sticky problem. Uh, it doesn't mean that the rest of it's not any yeah. good. It's, it's a totally separable, independent thing that can just be next because yes. we're not going to come to fast agreement on it, nor is it e an even easy problem to solve. Yes, that seemed to be, and when I went back and read all the emails and looked at everything, it's, they can remove that. Um, I was thinking maybe we'll do a quick come of the room. Um, do people feel that we should um, do a working group last call on this document and, and fix that problem at the same time? Please hum now. Who thinks we shouldn't do a working group last call on this document? Okay, so mild approval versus silence. Okay, I can start something up and we'll figure out that, that wording then. Um, oh yeah, that's the running code example that the uh, William and Benno did over the weekend. And they actually addressed the problem by just not, Wes, by just not dealing with um, resolvers that aren't DNSSEC aware. And so that's the status on the documents. We've, we've definitely done a bunch of work, so. Um, but there's more stuff coming up. And Olifer, is Olifer doing this? Okay, um, I believe Olifer is doing this, he's gonna do this remotely, so we're gonna try this. Um, oh. uh, I will be demonstrating work done at the uh, hackathon, at the bits, Willem Torop and Nelnet Labs, at the bits and bytes tonight. Oh, that's right, oh, oh that's right. They're gonna demonstrate the stuff at the bits and bytes tonight as well. Thank you for reminding me. So who is, Oliver, Oliver also had a backup in case yes. it failed. Hey Tim, um, do you hear me? Oh, there he is, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this mythical stuff seems to be working uh, really nice. Okay, so I'm here to talk uh, as a follow-up to the discussion we had in the Dallas meeting on how to not answer any queries with everything that our name server, authority and the name server has. And uh, we have gone through a number of iterations of our thoughts on how the subject, and this is a summary of what's in the latest version of the document. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, everybody knows any queries are asked. There are many reasons why some people consider them uh, bad, they, and this includes it, and uh, yeah. So, we know that. Next slide. Okay, uh, we have been trying to figure out what are the actual uses of, uh, <clears throat> of any in the wild. Um, the most important one seems to be a debugging issue. A, a human asks a DNS responder for information just to see what that responder has. Frequently this is against authoritative servers or uh, resolvers. Sometimes people want to answer those, sometimes people don't want to answer it. So we want to be able to give back to people something that, they, uh, that tells them, no, we're not going to answer it. Next one is the probabilistic optimization that a number of implementations have done, various places. Back one slide. Uh, that is uh, 
that is what we want to do is give answers that does not uh, stop that process but may only delay it okay so uh, we are not making the situation any worse in some cases programmers think this is a wonderful idea to do something i.e get a and quad data records together or something similar not the spf or whatever they want um, that is usually correctable but the biggest problem that me and others face is this is used on large scale attacks frequently and while we drop most of these packets there are some that get through there are others that are not as good at it and we don't want to give out big answers next slide so uh, when joe mark and i wrote this draft uh, we uh, we made a number of assumptions and this is the set of assumptions we made uh, any does not mean all that's just a simple assumption we make. Some people may disagree with us, but that is perfectly acceptable interpretation because a resolver that may have one RR set from a, at a name, when it gives an answer, it just has, gives back what it has, there, the, and there is no guarantee it is all of them. And we think that same can be applied at all of the servers. Returning any RR, R code other than zero is a really bad idea. We're sorry we suggested it. Uh, we would really like something that resolvers can cast. So if somebody is being hammered with uh, any queries, they should not have to go back to the authority server. They can just absorb it locally and give out something really small. And we also believe that something is better than nothing. So giving back an empty answer is not a good thing. Uh, we would also like to have the answer, the answer give be friendly to a human that is looking at it so he knows what's going on. And the main focus of the document is to document in a standard document how to not how you should not return a big answer to an any query to prevent the amplification effects. Next slide please. So uh, one of the things that surprised me a little bit when I was doing research on these topics is how resolvers are, uh, vary in their interpretation of 2181, i.e. the part of it that talks about the credibility of data. So some resolvers will, if you ask first an in inquiry and they get a big answer back, they put it all in CAS and then answer from that. Other resolvers treat that any data they get with an any query as an indirect query and therefore they don't have the most authoritative data and thus they will ask a query upstream. So returning a big answer to these resolvers serves no purpose. If there are follow-up any queries to these resolvers they will return the data that they got via the better uh, the direct query. And uh, back so probabilistic optimization does not work in this case. Going forward, the approach that we want to uh, go back, uh, go to the next slide. Okay. Our approach is very simple. We want to only return one RR set to a, any query. We send that back and that should be sufficient. Uh, if we need to sign it, we will sign it. I operate uh, the DNS uh, authoritative servers that uh, do DNSX. So if it is from a DNSX sign zone, we will sign it on the fly. Uh, it is a little bit harder for uh, offline sign servers, but they can just pick one of the sets, our sets they have. Uh, this does not, uh, if, there is a name, if the query would have resulted in an X domain, an X domain should be returned. Uh, the document does not explicitly say you have to use a certain approach, but you can and pick whatever you want. We also talk about using a fake answer, i.e. answer that is only returned when the query is for any and uh, my servers today return HINFO. And the main reason we picked HINFO is almost all code deployed on the network that humans operate can display that record type. Next one. 
bum, bum, bum. So, uh, according to the okay, I did. Um, and I think I think um, Oliver, I, I I think we. I don't think we actually did the adoption. I think you and I went back and forth on that. I couldn't find a, an example. So of that. you you press the button in error. That's fine. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Uh, Joe and Marek and I think the document is almost finished. So we are asking for a working group call last uh, basically now. Uh, there are a number of implementations that have already done this. This has been running on the internet for a little while. So. Feel free to shoot me now. Over to you, Tim. Oh, no, here comes Ed Lewis. Hello, Oliver. Hi, Ed. Uh, this is Ed Lewis. Um, I, I've already posted comments about this before, well, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, I won't, iterate, I won't repeat what I said there, but I, I would say this should be adopted by the group uh, because it needs to be worked on. I don't, I think that there are, the I have sympathy for what we want to accomplish with this. Um, I don't, there's certain things about the approach that I think are not right. And I think the document needs to have a better justification, but I think it should definitely be adopted by the group and then worked into a shape where it's justifies the actions a little bit more cleanly for architectural reasons, but also, um, answer uh, to making this, an, the, the being less uh, hacky about how you respond back saying, I don't do this. Uh, of course we will. Okay, so and maybe we can do a hum in the room. Oh, did you want to respond uh, over? If the document is adopted as a working group document, then we will uh, abide by what the working group wants us to write to get it ready for publication. That sounds good. Excellent. Oh. Marco Sanz, we already adopted this. I remember it clearly from the last time we sat together and even Paul Hofsen document in, in Subversion reflects that. Yeah, I could not find something in the mailing list archive, which confused me. So um, we, that, that was the part that, that made me sort of stop and saying that was was that. Um, but I figured we'd just do a quick hum of the room. Um, who who thinks this document should be, should be adopted by the working group? Anyone opposed? Okay, it's adopted, Oliver. Um, and please please make a note. Um, and then we can, we'll, we'll probably wait a little bit and figure out the, the things and then kick off a working group last call. Thanks. Great. So thank you very much. And that actually works. Um, yeah, for those of you who are waiting for the current instantiation of the special use names discussion so it can be over so we can get on to other business. Um, it's on the agenda this time because after Prague and after the Dot Onion last call, we, uh, realized we needed to take some steps to organize how the working group is, is dealing with the because with the, with um, special use names. The topic is on our charter, our AD and um, the ISG have been very supportive of us taking on trying to make some sense of uh, what we've learned from trying to actually ex execute on the, the, the process we have. Um, we've taken some steps. We, um, we did charter a design team. We have a problem statement draft. We told them that their initial task was to uh, attempt to survey the space and, and get a good look at what we had already learned in the course of the attempts we have made to execute on, on what the process in RFC 6761. Um, so there is a draft. There is um, a couple of folks who've been doing some work. We are still looking for a couple more folks to do work, although frankly, we are trying very hard to keep the design team fairly porous in the sense that we know there are plenty of people who can do good work on this. We're looking for reviewers for revisions of drafts at least as hard as we're looking for people to write to work directly on the draft and so on and so forth. The other step we've taken is we've asked um, Ralph Droms, who is in the back of the room, to sort of take charge of herding the cats and making sure that uh, this effort 
makes makes progress. Um, he's a very experienced IETF guy, and many of you know him. Um, has some interest in, in in the problem space without being too close to it. And um, we actually really appreciate the work done already with the design team we have, and um, Ralph's willingness to take on the cat herding chore. So, uh, Ralph, if you have anything to add, and then um, we have a a, a, specific, a very specific and we think focused discussion to have here, where we uh, where we want to look at just do we have the right have we identified the right issues, and looking at where we might go for next steps. It is very strictly we, we're trying to keep it very focused. And yes, the time the time constraint will be observed. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, Ralph Drums, I'm currently on the IAB and I chair the DNSSD working group. Um, and I'm the uh, AD who is responsible for shepherding RFC 6761 through in its uh, current publication state. So when Suzanne and I talked about the design team that's looking at our experience with actually running the code, uh, to put some names in to the special names registry through RFC 6761, it seemed to me that uh, exactly as she pointed out, I, I, I have uh, experience in the area. I'm uh, uh, sort of responsible for the hand grenade landing in the room to begin with, so maybe I ought to take some responsibility for, for jumping on it. And um, uh, I think I can uh, herd the cats to, uh, to get us to a good conclusion. Now this morning, I just took, the, took on this role a couple of days ago. I am still very much in, in learning mode. So uh, the members of the design team have done a lot of work. They've prepared some slides. They have some, um, some slides to guide the discussion today. I'm gonna let them go ahead and do their discussion. I'm just gonna stay out of the way, take notes, keep track of what's going on, and if needed, um, unplug microphone line so, we don't, so the discussion stays within the 30 minutes. Great, thank you. Yeah, could you, before you before you step back, there is something I hope you would say a word about. We had discussed um, the because of the, the, the nature of this, of this work, we do have some pretty clear ideas about how we're gonna make sure that it's transparent and we're in, engaging the working group. Um, if you oh, okay. had, yes. a, had a couple of words on the, the state of that, that discussion. Yeah, we haven't come to a, a, a complete conclusion about how to implement this, but at the top of our list of, of important things to do is make sure that, that whatever we do, it's transparent. So we, we, we as a design team will be conducting um, regular meetings. We're gonna post results from those meetings. We'll post minutes. We um, uh, will make regular reports to the working group. Uh, between um, IETF meetings and certainly at IETF meetings, and we will be happy to accept your input, your discussion about any of the things that we post in minutes uh, and, and uh, meeting minutes, et cetera, uh, all along the way. This is not a, um, we're gonna go off in a room someplace and uh, as if by fine magic, uh, an answer is gonna pop out. We're gonna be running a process because we're the collection point for the input from the working group. We're not the, 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 the extra smart people who are actually gonna do the work. I mean, actually make the decisions. I said, we're gonna do the work, we're not gonna make the decisions, so. Yeah, um, the only thing I'd add to that is that um, to, to address the point that was made at the microphone on the agenda bash, we are not wedded to the idea of spending working group time and face-to-face -face meetings indefinitely on this. Oh. We're gonna do whatever it takes to make progress, which is probably going to include not only pushing as much discussion as we can to the mailing list, but um, also we are, perfectly open and in fact encouraging of the idea of doing interims devoted to the topic if that's what it takes if that's if that's helpful to people yeah my my idea in in uh, coming back to the to face-to-face -to -face working group meetings is more in the interest of um, high bandwidth information sharing rather than face-to-face -face discussion of, of what's going on that all should take place off the mail or on a mailing list or in interim meetings not right. uh, at these meetings. Okay, so we don't want to get stuck on a process discussion. So you guys, and then we'd like to ask um, Peter and, and, and Alan to do the, the slide deck. Uh, Joel Yegley again. Um, so yeah, my hope here is to um, channel um, the concerns that we have uh, over our experience of running this process twice now uh, into something productive. Um, we don't want to make a decision for the IETF community like, and I don't want the senior management to look like they've made a decision on behalf of the IETF community as a result of this. So 
Like, uh, even if we were to come to some con conclusion that states that this work should be done elsewhere, we actually need to come to that conclusion as a community because we have another position on record already. So, um, but that's what I'm looking for here. Thanks. Uh, I'm Andrew Sullivan, um, and apparently we've got a rock star microphone up here. Um, so, so we we keep talking about this like here. It's a singular problem space, and we just said this problem. Um, and I'm wondering whether one of the possible results from this, I, I guess I know the answer to this, but I'm trying to confirm it on the record, uh, is that this is actually multiple problems and we're just going to split it up. That's one of the ideas I hope we're going to be hearing from the working group about, but I'm personally no hats inclined to agree with you. Uh, Pollard, so, Suzanne, do you mean from the working group or from the design team? I'm sorry? You said you, you hope to get advice and, uh, on, on, on whether this problem would be split I want to hear from the working group as feedback to what the, the design team is just doing the work of how do we set up the question. We can end up throwing out the work that's been done so far. We just had to start somewhere. Okay, so just call me really confused. <laughs> Jeff Houston, plus confused. Um, I sort of heard oh, the design team is going to go off and do what it does, but they're going to report back regularly, but there's going to be no working group time to actually talk about what they're reporting that's back That's not on. what I said. So that's what Ralph said. So I, I listened to everyone, not just you. <laughs> so I also heard Joel, and I really didn't understand anything he said. So, you know, it was, it was great, but it didn't add to my comprehension of this process as being a process where folk who have an interest in the topic and wish to contribute to working through what is acceptable both for the IETF and to the broader community who have interest in names can actually listen and be heard. And what I heard was this design team is going to go off and regularly report. That seems a bit one way to me. No, I, I did say that we would, we would be um interacting with the community and, and accepting community input, just not here in face-to-face -face meetings and in, in, in IETF meetings. And I wouldn't even say, you know, chair a hat, we're, we're not, all right. You're right about what the process needs to be. That ha absolutely has to be the result. I think Joel was clear about that. I think all of the direction and all of the input that we've gotten has been very, very clear that this has to be by, you know, this has to be an open process. What that means is we are listening, we've picked a place to start. And in fact, if the working group wants to throw out everything that's been done so far, I'm not sure what we'll do next, but we picked a place to start. We are open to using any of the processes and tools available to us in the IETF to make progress. If that means people want to continue to have working group, you know, face-to-face -face meeting time on the topic, if that's helpful to people, we're happy to see it. I think this is helpful to people. I think this is as big an issue now as it was when, was it 2860 or 70? When whichever one it was that did that original deal around addresses and names and saying to other, you know, to the IANA, you know, sort of. <laughs> I've got it half memorized. A, it's as big a deal now as it was then. Okay. And therefore it deserves time and attention for folk who wish to attend and participate in considering this again. Right. Thanks. All I meant to point out, and I think I think we're demonstrating here that we're willing to err on the side of openness and discussing what people want to discuss. Although we are not going to, again, not not going to be able to allow, you know, indefinite. But just on the process discussion, I'm open to continuing to spend time on this in the face-to-face -face meetings. I am also more than open to doing things like scheduling interims, um, certainly the mailing list, any of the tools and processes available in the IETF to help make us make progress on this. So I'm sorry if, if we sounded like we were saying anything else. And I see Warren and then Yari, and I can't very well say no to either of them. Hope you see me as well. But I would very much like to get onto the substance of the discussion so we can decide if we're getting near a problem statement where we can then decide what to do with it process-wise. So Warren Kamari, kind of following on what from Jeff said on you know, how people can participate. 
Um, on October 8th, which is about a month ago, the chairs asked for volunteers who would like to participate. And we never heard back. And I think people are fine not being on this, but it would be useful, I think, for people to know, you know who's actually participating, what the long-term plan is, is this the design team, is it gonna grow, is it not? You know, just something like an acknowledgement or go away, we don't want you. Any of these are fine. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to provide sort of an IST view into this and, and you know, part of the reason that we're discussing this, of course, is, is that we said um, there's an issue here and we need to look at that. Um, and we felt that it's not something that we should fix, but you, the community, should fix. And exactly how we, you know, handle that in detail and the design team, this community discussion, what particular meetings you do that discussion, that's up to you. But, it, you know, the key point is that the community needs to decide what to do here, and, and that, that's what we wanted to achieve. Um, the other observation I would make is that, uh, just kind of hoping that we'll, we'll get to the, the actual substance. I mean, obviously the design team, success the design team, but we should um, get to discuss the substance also, and not just when we discuss the substance. Thank you, Yari, and to Warren's point very briefly, um, our apologies for not being more communicative about that. Um, the process has not held together particularly well so far, and that's why we actually appointed a lead. Um, the, we're trying not to be too specific on, the, on the, the, the final makeup of the design team because, frankly, we wanted to make sure that work got started. Um, but we're trying, frankly, to keep the, the process in the service of the result rather than the other way around. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. So I guess, the, the, I guess the 30 minutes start now, right? So. Good, good, good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Koch. I work for DINIC. I do not work for Monty Python, although I feel like in one of their movies already. Um, so uh, this started in Prague with a presentation given by Alain and myself. Um, after Prague, we got Joe Eberle on board, uh, who took most of the work on himself to um, digest the slides into readable texts, full sentences, and so on and so forth. And you've seen, you hopefully, how many of you have read the draft? It's more than I would have expected. Thank you. So you've seen uh, the individual submission. It's not an adopted document because we're a design team still. Actually, we weren't a design team at that time, but let's not dive into that detail anymore. Um, so this document uh, was intended to like, make the bullet items and the content of the slides actionable and workable. Uh, from there, we are, we're aiming at a, uh, a problem statement. Uh, the task is not to work on solutions, but to illustrate the problem. Uh, we have discussions within the team uh, to like sketch out potential areas of solution space. That's a subtle disti um, distinction that we may come to later. So you find the draft problem statement there. Uh, everything else was mentioned. I guess I can skip that. Yeah, we were uh, late, but we met the deadline as many other people. So thanks for reading it in the short time anyway. Um, so we've sketched that in three different uh, aspects, architectural, technical and organizational aspects of implementation of the protocol, protocol in quotes. Um, what we mean by that is the process described in 60, uh, 67, 61, that was executed twice actually, once for 67, 62, that was the initial uh, local TLD assignment, and then again uh, with the Onion TLD. So architectural. Um, there is an observation that was discussed on the mailing list and on uh, various other occasions that namespace is not just the domain name system. There might be other namespaces that not only not make use of port 53 but have completely different concepts. Uh, some may remember .uucp, .bitnet and other stuff and completely different namespaces. Um, <coughs> usually there's a way to signal which namespace to select and in which namespace to resolve names. The prime example for that was uh, the local TLD or non-TLD, I should say, and uh, the other top-level domain like selectors that I just mentioned uh, and that, that have been used in the past. <coughs> uh, there are different ways to signal this namespace selection. 
could be on the left of a URI by the scheme. It could be to the right, the suffix, the, what we call a top level domain or somewhere in between, which actually doesn't exist yet, but could be in, in solution space. Um, and there are a couple of precedents for namespace selection happening with a suffix that looks like a TLD, but probably isn't. And uh, the most prominent, well, localhost uh, predates all this, but local and onion as TLDs and bitnet and UUCP and you name them. <coughs> so how do I know that something is a suffix that should select the namespace and not part of the namespace itself? Especially how do I know if my implementation predates the instantiation of that namespace? Um, should applications check some registry of suffixes before either falling back to the default or selecting a particular resolution mechanism provided they have it at hand? Um, and if yes, should that be a dynamic list? Should before issuing any query, or for every query, I should say to be precise, should before issuing every query, the selector mechanism should be, uh, should it be consulted? Or is that something with a timeout once a day or depending on the application? That, that needs to be clarified. What happens if the, if, there is no intelligence about what the selector actually is um, or if the selector can't be found because maybe the registry or the copy of this registry is outdated. And then again, is that an end system issue? And that might be actually overtaken by events, but uh, assuming a traditional model of we have a computer system with some libraries and operating system and applications on top of them, um, is that an application issue that should be dealt with in every application or something that we can um, delegate to some notion of operating system that might still be current uh, in, in today's time? And of course, the same question applies to the resolution mechanisms. Um, it's yours? So the next set of issues are about organizations. Uh, we divide it into two categories. What is in, in between organizations, so inter-organization, and what is within the IETF, so intra-organization, and we call this a process. So um, first, in between organizations. Uh, so when we ran this process for uh, first local home and, and then onion, it was clear that there was a lack of clarity between 6761 and ICANN ITF MOU 2860. Um, the MOU said that all the names are policy issues that should be dealt by ICANN except for technical stuff. And technical stuff is vague. It's not really defined. There are examples of that, like things like in dot .arpa. That was the example given in 2860. Uh, 6761 made a different reading and essentially extended what is technical to things that were applied then to dot .local or then later to, to onion. Uh, so there's, there's a bit of a tension here. Um, now, people have said, well, maybe this should be simply be handled by ICANN because this is named and should not have anything. Um, so a couple of notes. The first one is, there's a GTLD program in ICANN, but the current round of GTLD is closed. There might be another one, or may not be another one, don't know yet, but the current one is closed. Um, but moreover, the current GTLD program was really aimed at delegating operational TLD. If you look at the application guideline, it was really impossible to simply reserve a name without operating it. So if you want ICANN to take care of this, some other something that will have to be done within ICANN to enable this. It's not necessarily rocket science, but it will have to be done. Um, so as I mentioned, there's some current thinking we now within ICANN, but uh, as SAC is looking at this and other folks are looking at this to, should there be another round? And this is probably a good time to have this discussion over there. Now, inside the IETF, so, intra-organization of essentially what we call process around here. 
So when you ran the experiment with Onion, really show a lack of clarity in how ITF should evaluate the proposals. The 6761 RFC says it has to be an ISG decision in the end, or it's an ITF standard or an ISG decision, but it doesn't say anything really about how this is going to be achieved. So the only thing it says is, oh, there has to be answers to seven questions. So not very surprisingly, some candidates have simply written a draft, they have the answers to the seven questions, end of story. Uh, that leaves two other things on the table. First one is the technical evaluation of what is being proposed. Like if somebody creates a stupid random protocol that is harmful to the internet, maybe we should say no. No. Uh, so this technical evaluation has to be done. And actually 6761 called for the publication of a standard document about a protocol, not a pointer to something else on the outside. Uh, the second thing is the evaluation of a string that is being proposed. So is there a need for a specific string in the request or any unique string will be okay? Is there a value in the set of characters that make up a string? Is it some kind of a vanity name that somebody wants to derive some profit from or is it just a unique identifier and the property is the unicity? Uh, are there like non-technical reasons of good enough to reserve a string or should we, because the ITF is technical, should we enforce a technical reason for it? Uh, is demonstrated prior use of that string reasonable enough? Also known as cyber squatting in some cases, but let's try to be smart polite here. Yeah? Uh, but moreover, what name is reasonable? If, you know, just before, it was just Halloween a few weeks ago. And the day before Halloween in the US, there's a tradition of mischief night, where people do all kinds of weird things. So there is a union of a mischiefer who may define a protocol. And that protocol will be about, you know, exchanging where they are, where they want to do mischief. And they go through this process, technically sound, and what they suggest is dot UM for the union of mischiefer. Would that be a reasonable choice for this community to accept? For those who don't know, UM was United States Minor on the islands, and it has all political connotation to it. We have many other examples of that that could create problem. Um, on the ICANN land, there's a process to review those TLD application, to look at the name, and to see if the name has some kind of connotation to it. Is it, for example, something that is potentially offensive to some community? Or is it something that has some uh, political ramification. Um, you may or may not know, but there have been a lot of discussion about Africa, Amazon, and all those things, and it's endless discussions. The process to run this is, at ICANN is very complex, very heavy, very expensive. An observation is IETF currently does not have any such process at all. So, um, now that we have looked at all of us, and specifically the last one about how to evaluate names, this is just the current thinking of the three of us in the current form of design team. We look at this and says, what could be a way forward? Well, we look at essentially five things. One option could be simply to say, yeah, this is way too complex. Let's just close the 6761 registry, declare this, it was an interesting social experiment, and now we know better, we don't want to go there anymore. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to say, there's some value in looking at this right switch, right hand switch of a name. And uh, in, People want to do this new protocol, new alternative namespace or alternative protocol or a mix of the two. Um, Stefan Bosmeyer was observing in the mailing list yesterday that sometimes it is the same namespace with a different protocol or different protocol and different, same protocol, different namespace or a mix of the two. So there, but there are some people who found some value there. So if we could constrain the organizational problem 
both the inter-organization problem and the process issue within IT has been given some value there. And we have noted that things like the dot alt proposals fit in that category. There are other things that have been suggested like XXS dash and some kind of a hash so that we remove essentially the value of being on the top level. Um, another set of solution is to say, well, that's really important, let's create a process. Now we can argue, should it be an ICANN process? Should it be an ITF process? Should it be some kind of a mix of the two? But that's one possible set of way forward. Let's create a full-fledged process that will be built from learning what we have seen so far and doing something better. Um, another set of solution is to say, well, that was using the right end switch. Maybe we could use a middle switch. Remember, like we could use a different method, a tag at the end of a name, or put something in the URI that says switch somewhere else. Maybe ITF can charter some work in that area and to say this may be a better long-term solution. I would first observe that none of those are essentially exclusive from the other. We could pick a couple of those, we could pick none. And that, of course, the five possibility, fifth possibility that is something completely different. This is just like uh, a brain dump of where the three of us that have been working on this for the last couple of months are. And of course, this is open for discussion. Okay. So the principal thing I think we want to make sure we address before we worry about whether the, excellent. You are all going to talk about whether we've identified the right issues, right? <laughs> What do you think is missing from, not this slide. Why is this slide so, there, so, Dan? But the discussion of what the issues raised have been. <laughs> Don't give us that slide and tell us we can't talk yeah. about it. Come yes, on. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you actually, if, if you go to slide eight briefly, the, your last slide, right, and number D, the HTTP dot slash selector. So now go back to slide number three, please. Sorry, is it four? Maybe it's four. Yes, four. Notice one of them is in blue. I rest my case about the discussion of any selectors. What exactly is that case for the record? What's, what's your claim here? What, what's the point? The, the, the point is if any other kind of selectors would have worked, like we would have already be able to use the, the, uh, some, some other DNS class, for instance. Like there are no other selectors. Okay, like, thank you. Discussing other selectors. Do you think that's covered in this? Do you think that issue is covered, or is that something they need to add to the to the draft? No, I think they should just stop the technical discussion on other selectors because that will never be selected by humans. Okay, thank you. Hey, Lewis. Um, actually, I was going to pick on the same thing Paul was, but for a different reason. Um, the discussion about whether this belongs to DNS out. I've heard the uh, AD say it belongs here for a reason. The reason why I have a hard time accepting that completely is the same thing that is on slide 8D um, because I don't know that the expertise to, to evaluate D is in this group. Correct. That's right. why we're not doing that yet. No, I'm just saying this is, this is why I'm having a hard time deciding if it really belongs. Do you here. have an opinion about whether the draft has identified the correct issues? It's on the way there. I'll put it that way. Could you, could, you quali could you qualify that? As we're going through there, um, I would call probably things I consider lower level NIP things. I don't really want to spend time on the mic with right now, but I think it's getting towards that. It's going in the right direction. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, fan text. And I, I'd appreciate if we could refrain from discussing the solution space sketch on slide eight, but instead go back to the question, have we identified the problem correctly? Um, Stefan Bartmeier. Now I'm even more confused. I will go back to the meta discussion. Uh, we have been told that the goal of the design team was to work on the problem space and to describe the problems, which is indeed what the current draft more or less is doing. Now there is a slide about a way forward with a lot of possible solutions to a problem which is not defined, not even agreed on. And then you told us that we should not discuss the slide that we just saw. So 
uh, I could we, I could have I could have presented a slide with a picture of my cat, which I don't have, but it, which is heard by Rolf. Can we stop discussing the slides and discuss exactly. the draft, please? Yes. So to be sure that I understand, uh, the goal of the design, the mission of the design team, the, uh, is to uh, describe possible issues that some people have with RFC 6761. Is it limited to this or does it include uh, new wild, uh, new URI schemes or grammar or things like that? My understanding as a member of the design team is that developing new URI schemes is not part of the mission. Yeah. Suggesting that that might be the in solution initials? space could be an interesting addendum to the deliverable of the design team. Is that a satisfactory response? If you have an opinion on the draft, please send. Actually, you reviewed the draft, and thank you very much for that. That's incredibly helpful. I have opinions, but after. <laughs> At the end of the lunch. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan, and um, uh, I want to respond to some things that I think are in the draft, and also that and I said it, uh, in this presentation. Uh, so Alain said, um, maybe it's easier just to talk about precisely what he said here, that um, uh, 6761 extended the meaning um, that's in RFC 2860 um, uh, uh, about what are these technical um, domains. Uh, I don't know that that is self-evident. I don't know that that is the plain meaning of the text and uh, in, in, in 2860. I agree that it is possible that there would be a dispute about this, but it also turns out actually that uh, 2860 has a mechanism by which you could resolve such a dispute, and that's to ask the IAB because it's the final um, um, decision maker on this. Um, so I think that um, uh, claims about you know who has the um, uh, uh, wh whether um, 6761 was legitimate or not are. Um, not a good idea here, and I really, I really want to encourage us not to get into that particular rat hole. There are a lot of rodents down there. Uh, moreover, I, I want to point out that the this uh, presentation, and in fact, some of the text um, in the in the draft, seem to be suggesting that the right answer here is to make a lot of procedures for how you make a bunch of decisions. Um, uh, and um, and I, I want to point out that you know I can it's true has this elaborate decision making um, process and and a five volume um, applicant guidebook um, for how to make um, new TLD applications and they still didn't manage to catch the fact that a allowing dot home was dangerous so uh, it seems to me that the fact that 6761 has a process by which you have to get IESG approval has a very high bar. This community uses sound technical judgment and, uh, and, and the responsibility of the IESG, which is subject to recall uh, and, and appeal, um, as a substitute for elaborate procedures that write everything down. And I believe that that is the right direction to go. I don't think that that is, a, I don't think that is the problem in 6761. I think the core problem in 6761 is that it is not clear enough about whether we're talking about one namespace or potentially multiple namespaces. And if we clear that up and figure out a mechanism by which, um, or, or at least set the problem as how do we figure out when we're treading into, into the DNS and how do we make sure that the coordination is really good on this, um, then we will, uh, we will have a tractable problem. Um, but if the plan is to set up uh, um, uh, a mechanism by which we create the ultimate elaborate process by which these kinds of disputes can be can be resolved, I predict confidently that we will be having this discussion in another 10 years as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm John Levine. I speak as someone whose email address used to have an exclamation point in it. So, um, um, my my specific concern is that I don't see I, I see a, a sort of two sets of issues that are not separate separately called out here. You know, one is sort of the dot home dot Belkin problem, <laughs> which is names that have some quantifiable tech, tech, technical issue that might, in theory, go away at some point if if prior use goes away and stuff like that. And the other is dot onion, which is sort of a namespace that people people intend to use forever. Um, and I think I mean, the solutions for those are 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 different. And I don't 
I, I didn't see anything in this slide that suggested that you might you might address this one this way and that one that way. <coughs> Keep going. I just quickly wanted to say something that I hadn't heard yet. Which Who is, are you? Oh, hey, I'm Warren Kamari. Which is thank you very much to the authors of this document. I think it's really useful, and you wandered, in, wandered into shark-infested waters knowing that there are sharks in there. Um, I think the document's really good, and if people haven't read it, they should. Thank you. Hello, Doug Otis. Um, I think we have a lot of history showing that everyone expects to have the resolution, uh, if it's different than DNS, to be seen within the the, the rightmost label like dot .local, localhost, perhaps home. <laughs> and as these things evolve, I think that, that is the direction forward. And if we're going to have programs that know to watch for these things, I think we need something like dot .arpa, which maybe we can have dot .alt or some, some method of listing all these exceptions. I hope they're not going to be that many. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but, but I... I see that this is a growing problem because even in the home networking group, they just called it site local. And so that means you have namespaces that are going to be injecting themselves and perhaps stepping on proper DNS names if they're not aware of what they are because things change over time. So I think it, be, it behooves us to work on a scheme to make sure that that doesn't become a problem in the future. I wonder if I could interrupt for just a second. Who all is in the mic line now? Thanks. Would you raise your hand if you're in the mic line? Okay, great. Thank you. You should probably cut the mic line after. Again, okay. Yeah, you, 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 Ralph's got that power, so thank you. Jeff Houston, one of the old farts who was around at the time when 2860 was done and actually remembers life before that and the reason why we did it. I think the draft is light on an analysis of what 2860 was intending to do and light in its intra-organizational analysis on precisely what the role that the IANA delegated to ICANN is all about in terms of the looking after the DNS namespace. The analysis seems to be weak insofar as what 2860 was intending to do was to say to the IANA, that namespace, irrespective of its means of resolution and its protocol of resolution, that namespace is something the IETF is no longer capable of determining policy regarding its distribution. Please go figure. And we all know what happened in the subsequent events, but Je Jeff, was Jeff, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm not clear about, I'm clear about the result that you just said, but I, I missed. The analysis in the draft of the history of that particular document right. that set this up is weak. And I was, Okay. Including some explanatory text where I thought it yeah. was weak. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. take it as read, I'll press on. No, no I, I, I missed the statement. You think that 2860 does a delegation of the entire namespace to ICANN management? With the, you know, exactly as it says, with the technical exceptions. Okay, great. Thank which you. is really where this whole thing sort of opens up. Yeah, I'm but sorry to interrupt. I wanted to get that it, right. It's not that there's this... It's only the DNS resolution protocol, et cetera, et cetera. It was the entire namespace at the time. And what I hear here in this document is some certain amount of trying to create, well, if it's a different resolution protocol, do we go and look over the original advice? And maybe you might make that explicit as a yes or no. It's the namespace that went, irrespective of its means of resolution, might well be something you might want to say. In terms of the intra-organizational roles, again, you might have to look at what has evolved and who has what role. There is no doubt in my mind that the IETF is not the court of appeal of ICANN. So if you don't like what ICANN's doing, coming here doesn't give you legitimacy as a complainant to ICANN. And I don't think anyone would like to even see that happen. So in terms of intra-organizational roles, I think the IETF respects, I'm gonna use the word integrity, but it's more about completeness. If you have a problem over there, the solution lies over there, it doesn't lie in this room. And you need to make that quite explicit, that this is not a pressure release valve for someone else's problems. And then I think it's a little bit cleaner when we look at Dot Onion to go and review precisely 
why was this of some technical attribute that was outstandingly different or were we swayed by the politics of that other room at the time that this was a useful thing that they weren't doing? My own personal analysis is the latter, that that was a bad mistake for bad reasons and a bad precedent, but I'm going too far. What I'm really saying in the draft is you should make some of that more explicit about the completeness of ICANN and the IETF is not trying to judge it and that realistically what is over there is a namespace not just the DNS resolution protocol. Thank you. Thanks, and I am going to cut the line. Thank you. The mic line here. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Wendy Seltzer, coming to you from the application layer and uh, WE3C. Uh, <laughs> So I, I think one of the, the useful things that this draft starts to do is to, to help us in thinking about the layering uh, issues uh, that the, the domain namespace and DNS serve and that they might, uh, might serve differently, uh, that applications can use domain names um, and use some of the infrastructure but not all of the infrastructure of, uh, of the DNS resolution um, and uh, helping helping us to, to, to think about that and, and use those uh, more effectively um, would be valuable. Um, I won't rattle onto the, the, the slide of selectors in the middle, um, but uh, don't make us go back and add even more complexity to the URL spec, please. <laughs> so are you, are you favoring adding the complexity to the say the dns or the politics around that the complexity obviously has to go somewhere um yeah i i i don't think that there that that's a necessary uh, uh alternative uh, but sure that there are political uh questions but uh the, the technical uh architectural questions of uh what what we need to serve um, applications and to allow them to do uh, switching among uh, namespaces. So uh, as a question for you, coming from the application arena, uh, is it something that has to be done at really at the application layer or is it something that the application would like to use the underlying operating system and libraries to make the decision for it? I think that varies by application. Um, and but, no. there, there would it doesn't give me much to laugh but thank you <laughs> <laughs> well but it sounds like there might be some text to require that that would be helpful to have in the draft um and and if you would if you would send text thank you um stefan Martzmeyer. now um to talk about uh, practical things and not a metal process uh, what i would like to see in the draft we, uh, is something which is more in line with what it's supposed to do, which is a list of things that are missing in 6761, and that should be added later. A typical example, it's uh, one I suggested on the mailing list yesterday, was uh, to have some sort of formal language in the registry, so you can automatically derive application resolvers, libraries, etc., from the registry just by running some program to extract the data on turn it into actual uh, rules. Uh, today, there is, uh, it's indeed one of the problem of, one of the limits of RFC 6761, is that the only solution for an implementer today is to read the registry, find out the rules. Uh, unlike what you say, there are, are rules, because RFC 6761 say that you have uh, five, seven, seven questions to answer on what is the expected behavior of the different components. The only problem today is that it's in natural language, not in a formal language. So this could be an interesting uh, spending of the time of the working group to develop such a language and to improve RFC 6761 in that respect. But uh, another possibility, which, has, uh, which I also mentioned, would be to uh, write an informat uh, informative RFC about possible um, criteria 
for us uh, when dealing with an application, for instance, explaining uh, what, uh, that it could be interesting to consider the technical merit of the application, uh, the actual level of deployment, which is something which is not easy to measure, this sort of thing. So this would be practical and useful addition to RFC 6761, much more useful than discussing if we should uh, copy the ICANN process. I, I love the ICANN process, but maybe copying them blindly in the oh, IETF is not a good idea. Uh, Stefan, duly noted. I think that um, we did the gap analysis uh, on that, diving into patches or band-aids for the existing documents could be a bit premature um, at this moment. Uh, on the second note, um, I sense a set of different interpretations. You mentioned that there is an application and there should be an information in there how, it, how that is dealt with. Um, I would suggest that the sheer idea of applications that need to be dealt with is already not in line with the spirit of 6761, which says this is for standard track documents. It also says IESG approval, but if you go back to 5226 and read what IESG approval actually means, you will see that it essentially means standards track except exceptional circumstances, which actually may or may not have been proven in the previous case. Um, so I guess you are like two steps ahead, but again, duly noted, thanks for reading and very, very many thanks for commenting. So Stefan, I have a question for you. So you mentioned that you don't want an ICANN like process in IETF and I have a lot of sympathy for that position. Now, the question is, to go back to my example of the mischiefers, if those mischiefers arrive and have the protocol that and they suggest to use .um, what should IETF do? I think that uh, Andrew Sullivan already replied to this question. We have already a mechanism for decision at the IETF, uh, and, um, and it involves even possibility of appeal. For instance, if someone is not happy with the registration of dot .onion, there is an appeal mechanism. Just use it. But as I said that before, it could be useful to help IESG to decide with an informational document giving possible criteria on explaining the, uh, the limits. For instance, during the discussion on dot .onion, there were a lot of talk in the DNSF working group about uh, actual deployment. Is there an actual deployment? Uh, yes, no, on how to measure it. This sort of discussion could be captured in a document, and this would be an, uh, a useful document. But uh, defining a process, as, uh, as it was said about the ICANN applicant guidebook, uh, uh, you can write 600 pages of rules for process for selecting uh, uh, or approving a string and still have problems. So better not to go into that, that direction. And so, Andrew, you get the last word. Wow. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan, uh, again, and I should have made this disclaimer earlier, although I made it in the Jabber Room, but I'm making it now. It applies to the earlier comment, and it applies now. Uh, I uh, am speaking only for myself. Um, I really, really want to disagree with what Jeff was suggesting, that more um, history or analysis of um, 2860 goes into this draft. I think that that is, I, I think that that is a chasm out of which you will never emerge if you try to do that. So please don't do it. Um, it there's no question that there is a problem in the way that 2860 um, uh, did this assignment in that it, it it's true, it seems to say, well, we're giving them um, domain names and therefore we're giving them domain name space, except that there's a bunch of stuff that it then says, but we're not giving them all of the domain names. And that is, that's where the, that's where the problem is. I agree that there is some, some ambiguity here, but I do not believe that it is useful for this working group to try to produce anything um, that analyzes this, because I think you're gonna run smack into the problem of who actually has control, uh, change control over that MOU, and I don't believe it's going to be this working group. So I strongly <laughs> discourage God, I you hope not. from going into that problem. Thank you. So can, can, I, can I ask a question, Raf? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've heard multiple times today that uh, certain aspects of the topic um, might not be within the remit of the working group. And I tend to agree. 
um, please give me the right venue to solve this. Uh, I, 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 cannot, I cannot appeal 6761 because that ship has sailed. Assuming for a second, I'm not taking any position, assuming it was an unconstitutional document, what should I do? So if you actually think it was an unconstitutional document, then what you need to do is get IETF um, consensus to just kick it over. Um, so, so if what you want to do is say 6761 was a mistake, uh, and you want to uh, you want to make that argument and say, in fact, um, uh, you can't do reservations this way, then that isn't an interpretation of the MOU between the IETF and ICANN. I don't believe that that is um, the task that the AD has set for this working group. Um, but I will note that 6761 didn't come out of any working group. It, um, it went through the ISG separately. Um, uh, that may be because of certain functional problems with the working group where it might have properly been handled. Um, I'm, but I'm not going to comment on that. Um, uh, I think that the, the, the key point here is that I don't believe it will be productive for the working group to try to do um, historiography on 2860. Um, I know that there are um, disagreements about what the intention might have been, and I know that some people feel strongly that they were there and they know. Um, the, um, the facts in the academic world, however, tend to make us or give us reason to believe that people who were there are not always the best historians of the era. And I just don't want us to get into that problem. It's too big a problem, and it's one we can't solve anyway. We're not competent to do it, so let's avoid it. So, um, Andrew, uh, to responding to your point. Hold on a second. Um, first of all, we are running into being over time. Um, and also, I believe our AD has something to say towards us at the same point. And then I, I, I do want to hear what you had to say, but I think Joel has been, we'll, we'll have something to add. Um, can I answer? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I agree with you that a lot of this discussion has nothing to do with DNS and has even less to do with DNS up. That being said, I don't think I said either of those things. I, I, I think what I said is interpretation of 2860 is not this working group's job and I don't believe that you should do it. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, so this document was aimed at highlighting issues, not at solving them. So essentially it's using the same answer that Peter gave earlier about the URI scheme. We may want to say there's an issue here, but we're not going to solve it. I, I, I think that it would, it would be fine for you to say 6761 does it this way. Some people don't think that that was legitimate, but regardless, there is a dispute about how exactly to manage the allocation of these names. One possibility is that it's, it's illegitimate and we should just shut down 6761. That is one possibility, but you don't need to get into what exactly 2860 means in order to state any of that. You okay. can just say, there is some disagreement about this and I don't care how it happened. I, yeah, I agree with what you just said. Thank you. Yeah, this, this does sound like something that can be hammered out in text uh, to revise the draft, which is what we were after. I'll defer to our Yeah, so a quick comment with respect to the direction um, that we got um, in our charter, which is that um, the question uh, that the charter was intended to address is um, what to do about 6761. And if the answer is you write a document that says we don't like it, that's a perfectly valid answer, um, but yeah, I don't think um, I don't think engaging in uh, what's the right word hagiography or apologism uh, uh, associated with 2860 is probably the appropriate direction to go because um, I don't think altering our relationship to ICANN is really uh, something that we should be undertaking. Certainly, it's not covered by our current charter item. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I'm repeating what uh, Andrew said and Joel said, but indeed the IST asked, you know, please look at 6761. We did not ask, please look at RC 2860. That's not on the table. 
we, we can work out how to, I, but I think what I'm hearing is there, it sounds like there's been some useful feedback, I hope, to the team on the, the problem statement. And we'll, um, I hope, go back to the list. The thing I'd like to see from the, the, the team sooner than later is um, some sense of what feedback you got from, from the session and some sense of when they, they were, there might be a revision, a revision to the document. But thank you. Thanks everybody for your patience and your input today. I appreciate it. It's been a big help to me. Thanks. So who's next? Yes, thank you. I think, I think, yeah, I think that's Andrew channeling Joe as opposed to the usual case, which is Joe channeling Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, and, and Joe uh, Abley, my colleague at Dine, uh, wrote this uh, draft. And um, I wrote these slides, which are really short. Um, so if I got it wrong, you can yell at me uh, on the slides. But uh, I'm trying to make this. How many people have read this draft? Thank you. So very quickly, um, right, the problem is that um, we know that RR sets are unordered, but it turns out that the way you construct a section of, um, of a DNS message uh, includes the word append, and some people think that that means implicitly that the whole message is ordered, and other people think that that does not, and it really depends on how much of a background in set theory you have. <laughs> so this is what the draft says. Um, and, and so the idea is, um, since we have a disagreement about this, um, we're a protocol organization, and when you have a disagreement, what you do is you pick a rule and write it down. And so this is what the proposal is. Um, it's here on the slide, and I won't read it to you. Uh, I personally don't care actually what we pick, but this is what the proposal is. Um, so I think that there is a request uh, for this to be adopted and um, for us to publish it. Uh, and I think that the idea is basically people are already processing things this way because they really care about the order of answers, but maybe they don't care so much about other sections. So this is the way we would do it. But I don't think that there's a whole lot of measurement that proves this. I think this is just people's sense. So if you've got a whole lot of measurement in line with the technical plenary yesterday that shows that, um, something else, then you should probably state that. That's all I have to say. And, oh, we do. Hey, uh, David Lawrence, I just wanted to say that we actually have operational experience that at least one version of Microsoft DNS server expects that the opt record must be first in the additional section and will fail if it's not. Ah, so that's, that's interesting. So that's bad news for this draft. <laughs> um, because, because this draft says, right, the other sections um, can be unordered and you're not allowed to throw anything away uh, and you're not allowed to do anything about that and so that would make um, at least one resolver broken. Hi, Shimon Hakbar, and I have another uh, wrench uh, to throw in here. Um, so I mentioned this on the mailing list a couple of months ago, but in addition to ordering stuff in the answer section, there are actually implementations that expect stuff to be ordered in the authority section. So we came across a resolver implementation. This is not one that nobody has ever heard of. Uh, I won't name them here, but Essentially, it fails to authenticate negative responses unless the data, the NSEC records appear before their signatures. If they appear in the inverted order, it fails. So this is something uh, we're actually working with the implementation to try and get them to fix this problem, but this is something you may want to consider whether or not we want, if we're considering ordering anyway in the answer section, should we also impose a requirement that data RR sets and their corresponding RR signatures need to be ordered? That's my first comment. Uh, I'm, I'm not advocating it, I'm just, I'm just asking the question here. And the second comment I have is, uh, we're already uh, part way down this path, so I think, uh, I don't see Paul Waters in the line, I see him, okay. So the, there's a, another thing uh, coming up, the chain query option. It, that's already been adopted, right? It's in working group last call. So that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but it expects to order um, the authentication chain of RR sets in the authority section. 
Okay, that would make implementers' life easy when they're validating a, a chain of records. Not only that, I'm working on another proposal, uh, a TLS extension uh, to deliver a DNS chain. Currently, that does not use DNS messages. Uh, that uses an ordered sequence of RR sets in the validation order. However, if things like the chain query option and thing messages are standardized with an ordering, we may adopt that too. Okay. Uh, so, so I just want to be very careful here because it seems to me that there are um, there, there's an assumption in this, which is that what you read off the um, wire in the message is the is fundamentally the order that your um, application of that message um, has to treat it in. And I, I think that that's fundamentally the underlying thing here, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, and so I'm not actually sure that all of the cases that you're talking about really depend on the order of the wire message, um, but it de does depend on the order in which you treat them. So an alternative right. sure. um, uh, answer to some of the examples that you said is, um, when you're processing these things, you have to treat them in this order, but they could come in any order. That is, after all, um, what DNSSEC says in, in a lot of cases, right? right? Like there's mm -hmm. a canonical order sure. um, for, for the pur purposes of validation, but that doesn't mean that's the order you get it on the wire. Right. But I agree we need to be clear about it one way or the sure, other. Sure. We just need to decide who's, 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 who has to make the ordering decision. Right. Okay, thanks. I, I don't know who's next. I think so uh, I'm actually relaying a comment for Mark Andrews from the Jabber Room, and he uh, just mentions that the additional section has qualifiers for TSIG and SIG0. Hmm. Yeah, so we should probably... Um, Paul and then Donald and... Close the line. Yeah, after those two. Um, Paul Rogers. So for the EDNS query chain, um, if the draft suggests that it should be ordered, then I think we should fix that because it's... A, the way you would implement this would be you just loop over all the records and see if you can put them in the cache. And then if you fail in the end and have records that you can't put in the cache because they don't validate, you throw an error. So I don't think the order should matter at all. So, so if that's unclear from the draft, I'll definitely change that if, if people agree. And second for, for Andrew or Joe, what is this document trying to do? Is it trying to, to document existing behavior or if it's trying to clarify and restrict proper behavior? It, it's trying to update 1035 to solve a problem that 1035, what, what, what append means in RFC 1035 is not clear to everybody. And so what this is trying to do is specify what it means. So, I, so, so, so you take it into consideration? Or no, like, no. Like it, still... what, what it says is this is what you have to do in the answer section. The draft currently says this is what you have to do in the answer section. Other sections are, are wide open. But the point is 1035 says when you're, when you're building this thing, what you do is you take the thing that you have and then you append something else. If you're a set theoretic geek, then appending doesn't mean that there's an order there because right sure. in, but, yeah. but earlier you said when there was an implementation that required something that you didn't expect, you say, oh, that's a problem for this draft, suggesting that maybe you would append the draft. So I'm still confused about whether you are trying to dictate behavior or describe behavior. Well, normally, of course, what you do is, I mean, when you're trying to clarify a specification as old as the DNS specification, you try to clarify it in a way that doesn't break anybody in the wild. <laughs> so that's the only reason it's a problem. Uh, it's Donald Eastlake from Huawei. So it seems to be accepted in certain security cases and things you should be liberal in what you accept. And if we listen to all the anecdotes about what peculiar ordering, peculiar implementations require, how long will it be before there's a conflict between two of those? And isn't it better just to say it's unordered? And, uh, you know, so the broken implementations that require peculiar order have to get fixed. I mean, I come from a set theoretic background. From my point of view, these were unordered all along, but um, not everybody. So why did you write the draft this way? Uh, well, I didn't write this draft, oh, right? I... Joe wrote it. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I'm just the stucky because I happen to be in Yokohama. Um, so, um, so, so, but, but I, I don't feel strongly enough about the right way here to care it seems to me that we could also say, yes, you have to order these things, and that's the way it works. If we say that, then it'll, it'll encourage people to reject some answers produced by some servers, right? I mean, it seems like it'll decrease the... Um, my, I think the draft is wrong. So. Okay, no, we killed the mic line. Okay, 
Uh, unless, uh, is that a mark? I just want to point out, I mean, the word append does not appear in 1034, 1035. I want to agree with Donald. This I think it was in 20. Harm than leaving it as it is. Okay. Um, I think what we were going to ask is we wanted to get a hum of the room to see if we should adopt this in the working group and spend some time trying to sort this issue out. Can we get a hum if, if people want to adopt this and, and work on this? Hum now. And if people think it's a crazy idea and don't want to do this, please hum now. Boom. So the rejection is in. Okay. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> okay. So Paul. Um, okay, so next slide. Oh. Okay, so um, in, in trying to deploy more DNSSEC, um, big operators are having a problem of actually getting this, this trust anchor information upstream. Um, so um, this was, tr we tried to solve this in 7344, but at the time people thought this was a contentious issue. And so in the end, what happened was like, we didn't solve it and we just removed it from the draft before it became an RFC. So now obviously a couple of years later down the line, we still have to solve this problem. So the, the, the first big problem is that if you ask big operators, like, you know, we want you to enable DNSSEC, they will come back and say, okay, so in, in case something goes wrong, how can I disable this? And so the protocol didn't really allow for an easy way to disable this, even though you have a secure channel. So the first update that uh, we're suggesting in this draft is that uh, an operator can say with a signed record, please remove the DS record at the parent so that we become unsigned for whatever reasons. And so you know, there can be many reasons for it. And, um, and that this is how the, the record would look like. If you use this algorithm zero, which is reserved, it basically means no algorithm, no, like remove it. Then the a little more controversial issues is the, the, the initiative trust. And here um, I will alienate um, either half the room. I'm not sure the left side or the right side. Um, so um, the half of the room will say, well, you should go through the registry in the RRR model and this should all be solved and they should be doing this DS record. Well, that doesn't really solve our problem of having millions of signed DNSSEC domains now at a big um, provider uh, that wants to push this but doesn't have the resources to pursue this through the regular system because the, that system is just isn't there. Like DS records aren't easy to push through the registry uh, via the registrars. So some parents that are not bound by, by some legal constraints want to have an option to push this um, outside of the registry. Uh, sorry, outside of the registrar. Um, and so they can have different policies and depending on the policies, if, if, if something complies with their policy, then you want to have a mechanism. So one mechanism, uh, so, so I don't want to go into the details of what, what these mechanisms would be. That's another draft and it doesn't really belong in DNS off. So um, we're just looking at the protocol extensions for this to, to do this. Um, so uh, for the, the initiation, we don't need a protocol extension, but we, we need the ability to um, accept uh, the trust again. And so for instance, there's one, one TLD that wants to do this by monitoring it from various name servers. Um, once they get a trigger, um, check that the, uh, the, the, the signatures of finding the DNS key works and then generate the, uh, look at the existence of the CDS record and then put the DS record in after X amount of days, giving a waiting period. Um, but those are all policy decisions that are like outside of the, the, the specification. And I think that's it. Any questions? Oh, I, and I guess we're asking for adoption. Yeah, I, I figured, yeah, I was going to do a hum once we saw the usual suspects. We do have a couple of folks at the most. Warren Kamari, quick note. So I am one of the original authors of 7344, and we actually had the stuff in about delete. And the working group asked us to take it out, but the consensus, as far as I remember, was not very strong. And instead of fighting it, we figured, eh, we'll take it out. Somebody can always edit back later. So, right. So, so now I'm, I'm hoping that you know, with the this is a really big problem. We need to be able to disable this. Otherwise, big operators cannot enable it to begin with. I'm hoping that we we change this. Uh, John Leakinson from Sinden. Um How did the parents ever get the NS records? Uh, I mean, that, we, that problem has been solved years ago. I don't know why we need to solve it again for this record. Big, big, because a lot of these operators that are in, in the middle don't support um, things like adding a DS record or their resellers don't support it. Or there's, there's many ways in the, in the, the RR model 
where people just don't care because there's not enough money and, it, and it's just impossible to get your DS record up. Like, then, like imagine Cloudflare has millions of domains signed and they want to put this in .ca. .ca is ready, Cloudflare is ready, but there's no mechanism to make this happen. Uh, well, then get a different parent. <laughs> And I also, I don't think you can just turn in a set off either. So I, I think there's a good reason for not having it in the original draft. So, sorry, if, if, if the DNS operator decides that it wants to disable the DNS account, do you say the DNS operator shouldn't have the power to decide that? Well, they can do it if they want to, but I don't think we should encourage them to turn in a set off once they've turned it on. It's just, it's just well, going to well, cause pain for anyone who's... No, but sometimes you have to. Anchor. Sometimes you have to. Let's say the domain moves to a different uh, DNS operator that doesn't support the same DNS -like algorithm and they can't roll over. So they have to disable it. Like, nobody wants to, but... Well, before you turn DNS -like on, you should make sure you've got a good relationship with your provider that they will help you migrate. You don't know what happens in these relationships after they do something technical. That's sort of out of scope. Uh, I just wanted to, the big issue is with third party operators. The RRR model that ICANN has established really doesn't have any recognized role for a third party operator. And so the big problem with getting DS records up is that we're relying on customers to then interact with the registrar to get the right information to the registry. And relying on customers to do anything is a failing proposition. Yeah. John Levine, I, I can tell you from experience, I have 300 domains on my server. Half, all of them are all of them are locally signed. Only half of them are are actually DNSSEC because I only have a, I only have a relationship with 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 the registrar for half of those. I mean, so to the extent this provides some sort of tofu thing that would allow me to upload the other DS records, it's a win, even though it might not be as as beautiful as personally visiting every every registrar in the world and making friends with them. Hi, Paul. Over here. Yep. How are you doing? And then Ed, and then Jane, and then the la um, the person at the end, and then we'll cut the mic line. Um, oh, yeah. Go, Wes. As long as it's me first, I don't care. Yeah. Um, Wes Hardiker. Um, the delete, I don't care about. So I don't. You know, it'd be horrible to have them unsign their zone. But you know, at least it's being done securely. The bootstrap. You know, initially, I, I sort of thought, well, lots, there's so much leap of faith around the IETF, why not, right? Except that the problem is, is that we're storing more and more and more stuff using DNSSEC as a security bootstrap. So, so by allowing that initial leap of faith, we're actually providing a leap of faith to a whole bunch of other stuff, Dane, um, SSH fingerprints. Um, you know, there's there's an awful lot of other stuff that that makes me really hesitant to not require any authentication. And and maybe I think that you have the the concept right of it's out of bounds of the document to define how that initial bootstrapping authentication should be. But I think that we might want to put some some uh, initial policy parameters on it. You know, you must have some level of authentication um, and protection in order to accept a DS record. And, and you think that should be in this document or a separate document? I should. I think it should be in whatever document you're going to enable them to copy the so, DS record for the first time. I don't care where it is. Right. So, so the, there, like there's one. a there's a different document um, from Jacques, which I don't know where Jacques is. Uh, um, that actually has like one example of how .ca wants to do this and, and, and has an, 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 sort of tries to make it a generic way so that if there's more TLDs that do this, we will have a standardized way of doing this and not run into the whole same problem again of not having a known API. It, it's more the, um, the constraint on, on how it should be done. I don't think that we need to specify an exact way. I mean, great, if we have a standardized way, fantastic. If it's REST, great, you know, that, that's a, perfectly sufficient way. But in, in the meantime, I think that you gotta have a bare minimum. You can't just copy it. Right? So maybe it should be in this document in, in the security considerations? As a must, yeah. And, and Lewis, um, <clears throat> I wanna say is I'm for adopting this in the working group um, because DNSSEC was designed, in fact, the DS record was designed before the modern way of doing DNS came into play. The RIR, the TLD uh, area didn't really exist then. You can argue it was something there, but it's not like it is today. Um, the assumptions made in the technology come from a much older era. 
So it's worth considering this. And once we adopt it, then I'll attack the details of the analysis. Okay. Hi, I'm um, practicing a couple of comments from the Jabber room. Um, the first is from Mark Andrews, who says, fix the RRR model. <laughs> Would you care to respond to that before I go into the next comment? <laughs> no comment. Uh, the, the next uh, is from uh, Jim Galvin, who says that this does not fix the problem in the GTLD case. Uh, you cannot do TOFU. Uh, the data has to come from a registrar to get in the registry to get in the TLD's DNS infrastructure. Yes, we are aware that there's many TLDs that have contractual restrictions and we're not trying to, to undo those. Um, those people who cannot use it because of those contractual restrictions are encouraged to fix the process elsewhere where they think they can fix it. But we don't think we can. Okay. Great, thanks. So I, we got the sense, but we'll take a home of the room here. Um, if people feel this document should be at least adopted and worked on, whether or not we come to some resolution, please hum now. And if you think we should not work on this, please hum now. Okay, then we'll we'll continue on this way. Thanks. Uh, can I do the presentation from here? Because I want to look at the slides myself. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mukun Sivaraman. I work at ISC on Bind. Uh, I'm going to talk about DNS message checksums. Uh, I'm first going to talk about various problems uh, in, uh, to do with DNS messages, uh, various problems during transmission, security problems, and uh, what we can do to solve them. This is one of the solutions. The clicker doesn't work from here. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so these are all in the area of IP layer fragmentation. I'm sure you're all aware of how IP layer fragmentation works. Um, so the specific problem is that in the case of IPv4, the identifier, the fact it's usually used as a fragment identifier now, that's only 16 bits wide. So it's possible to spoof fragments by an off-path attacker. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how uh, fragmentation occurs and how an off-path attacker can actually provoke fragmentation from the source. Um, but some of them are considered in this document called fragmentation considered poisonous. That's the URL for it. And uh, there are other ways as well to force fragmentation to occur. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, when fragmentation occurs and there's spoofing possible, there are two types of attacks that can take place. Uh, I'm sure you all know how fragmentation, fragments are assembled. So once fragments are assembled, IP fragments are assembled, the, uh, the network stack uh, at the receiver, it does a, uh, after it passes the IP layer, uh, in, at the transport layer, it does a checksum check. So in the case of the UDP, you have a 16-bit UDP uh, checksum, which is equivalent to the IP before header checksum. Um, so there are two things that can ha that uh, that a uh, attacker can do. One is the attacker can, can cause the checksum validation to pass, and the attacker uh, the other thing is that the attacker can cause the ch checksum validation to fail. Now the UDP checksum is uh, something that uh, uh, it was designed to thwart uh, catch uh, um, uh, accidental changes on the wire, but not malicious changes to um, data uh, malicious poisoning attacks it's very trivial to um, defeat a, uh, defeat this mechanism UDP checks and mechanism um, when you have fragments you have you have the DNS message divided into multiple pieces and so these uh, anti kamensky measures such as source port randomization message ID randomization etc uh, do not work it ca cannot catch uh, uh, poisoning DNS cookies also similarly is a uh, it's a similar mechanism to these uh, anti Kaminsky measures, and even that cannot uh, catch actual uh, modification when more than one fragment is in use. Next slide, please. Now the other class of attacks is when 
the UDP checksum validation fails. So the attacker on purpose, in the previous slide, the attacker on purpose caused UDP checksum validation to pass by spoofing the um, spoofing values so that the checksum matches. Now, the attacker can also cause UDP checksum validation to fail. And in this case, what happens is that the uh, client's uh, network stack drops the, uh, drops the datagram. So the application layer never gets the datagram. So uh, this is basically a denial of service. So a few of these are examined in the paper that was mentioned previously. Uh, the general problem is that fragment assembly is controlled by the IP layer in V4, uh, at least where the problem lies. Fragment assembly is controlled at the IP layer. The application layer cannot say, uh, cannot pick and choose fragments because by the time the application layer gets the packet, it's already too late. Uh, the section validation has taken place already. So, An attacker can cause complete, whenever fragmentation occurs, an at attacker can cause unstoppable uh, disruption and denial of service um, to, uh, uh, to messages, specifically DNS messages in our case. So uh, the, the way to fix the case where UDP checksum validation passes is to use some kind of a checksum, uh, an additional cryptographically secure checksum. And a way to fix this attack where the UDP checksum validation fails is to use the DF bit in the IP header and you uh, move the uh, fragmentation to the application layer where it can actually pick and choose what fragments it wants to assemble. So uh, Shane is going to present uh, another uh, draft next, which is going to talk about this, um, uh, doing this in the, at the application layer, fragment assembly in the application layer. Next slide, please. Okay, so there have been comments about the, uh, this draft on the mailing list. So people generally ask, what about on-path attacks? This document only talks about off-path attacks. So the, the capabilities of an off-path attacker and an on-path attacker are quite different, and uh, they, can all be, they cannot all be addressed by a similar mechanism. So. An off-path attacker specifically can only spoof. They cannot monitor anything on the wire. Uh, they can attempt poisoning and uh, take their best shot and uh, hope that it works. But they're not able to do anything. They're not able to stop any traffic, existing traffic on the wire. They're not able to filter any packets. They're not able to do anything other than attempt to poison. Um, so in this case, uh, just stopping this fragmentation attack would be sufficient. Um, and also um, discovering any uh, poisoning attempts would be sufficient. If, you, if, if the client is able to discover that the message may have been poisoned, that, that should be sufficient, uh, a sufficient measure to get rid of off-path off attackers, problem of off-path off attackers. Next slide, please. On-path attackers, they can do, they can wreak a lot of havoc. Uh, they can do everything pretty much what an off-path attacker can do. They're able to inject uh, forged packets like an off-path attacker, but they're also able to monitor what traffic goes on the wire. They're able to filter packets so that they can completely block what a server is sending to the client through, through, through their path and send something else that they want to send. So very effectively poison, and they can uh, do all sorts of, these are called man in the middle attacks basically. Uh, so in this case, uh, the work that Deprive is doing, uh, it, that is a better match to stop this, this kind of attacks uh, of an on-path attacker. Uh, even even in, uh, with the work that Deprive is doing, there are still attack. If, if an on-path attacker is just going to drop packets, then it, it, it's pretty much unstoppable. The, the client cannot do anything. They can totally deny service. Next slide, please. Okay, so one more comment we got was, why don't we use DNSSEC? Just use DNSSEC and we're done with the problem. Now, it is true that RR6 can validate the contents of uh, uh, RR sets. So uh, a client can verify that no poisoning has occurred, but only for the RR sets that have been, uh, that have RR6 in them. So uh, some contents of messages such as uh, uh, in, a, in a delegation, in a, in a referral, you don't, you, you don't have RR6 for NS records, you don't have RR6 for glue, and you don't even have RR6 for EDNS options that are used more and more these days. Um, 
DNSSEC also will validate an RR, RR set and its RSIG, but it cannot tell you, uh, it cannot guarantee that the server actually sent this answer to you. So if you have a, an RR set and, it, uh, and it's RR6, you can, uh, you're thinking that the server sent this particular set to you, you can validate it. But that will not be the actual set, the uh, RR set the server actually sent you. Next slide, please. So there's a theoretical attack that can take place uh, with this. This is not very practical. It, it won't happen in practice. But th this is uh, an example for the last point on the previous slide. Uh, Hold on. Nick? Hold on. We're running way over time here. Oh, I'm and sorry. If we could take a couple of questions. How many people have read the draft? OK, so that looks like enough. Um, if you're asking for adoption, we can do, we can do that question. But okay, if you have one or two questions, but we're 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 way over time here. Um, hi, Mukund. My name is Roy Adams. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think you did it very well, just like uh, the last presentation and the other day. Um, one thing to point out, though, is you're trying to protect against a second fragment, fragment spoof, right? However, the solution is actually in that second fragment. So the problem is, right, if you use the second fragment and you put your checksum in there, the EDNS option is in the second fragment, you just spoof that second fragment and your solution is gone. And also the problem that you try to defend against is, is still there. So it is addressed in the draft. This is pointed out. So basically, you're deleting the option. So it's a downgrade attack. So what basically happens is that the client can detect that. So it knows that it has sent a checksum. It's a signal that it wants a checksum to the server. If you delete the option, the client can detect that the option is gone, and it can uh, go on to TCP, for example. But you can already do that. Yes, this is to detect poisoning. It isn't to um, tell you. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. You can already use TCP, yes, but you cannot detect the case where poisoning occurs. So, okay, I'll take this offline. I'll send you a message. Okay, Thank okay, you. okay. Um, Stefan Bartsmeyer, uh, the Schulman uh, fragmentation attack works only on IPv4 because the ID of the packets is uh, too small. So there is an obvious solution, move to IPv6, which is something which is quite realistic in the short term. So, uh, More seriously, um, it would be interesting to watch at what the other applications which use UDP are doing. For instance, uh, is uh, NTP doing the same sort of thing or other protocols like that? Do they do uh, application level fragmentation? It would be interesting to see what the other people do before we do the same mistake. Okay. We're closing the mic line. Uh, Wes Hertiger. Um, so thank you for enumerating all of the baggage that we have brought to the table over you know decades worth of, of DNS work, right? The, the problem is, is that your enumerated list like affects every protocol we have. And so personally, I don't think that this is the right place to solve this problem, right? This is, these are types of problems every application out there has. So we have other technologies that, that sort of fix stuff. You know, I mean, DNSSEC you mentioned is one of them. Uh, TCP is one of them. IPv6 is one of them. I'm not sure that, that the, the time is right to, to fix the DNS protocol with new bits in it as opposed to just moving to one of the other solutions that we want to move to anyway. We already, uh, we already work around a lot of the DNS, uh, we already work around a lot of the UDP issues um, in DNS. We have mechanisms in DNS to avoid ex exactly what UD, uh, issues UDP cause, causes, such as DNS cookies, for example, is not necessary at all if uh, you didn't have amplification attacks and also poisoning attacks, you wouldn't, you wouldn't require that at all. Um, things like uh, all these anti kaminsky measures that we do, we do that for DNA, in DNS software. So um, it, it is still very much a reality that DNS uses UDP right now. And it's not going to go away for a long time, for a very long time. Because of, uh, I've not had time to talk about TCP but there are issues with TCP that we cannot adopt it right now, although it, it's, a, it's something that we can do in the future. 
So for a long time, uh, the majority of DNS traffic will still be uh, UDP. So we'll have to fix these problems for DNS in, uh, in UDP over DNS. Sorry, DNS over UDP. I'm Peter Kovtenik. I like your presentation very much. Uh, thanks for bringing again the uh, attention of the audience to the Schulman paper. I think that's uh, interesting and people should be aware of and take some measures to uh, mitigate at least the easiest ways to exploit that. Um, I think that the part that you mentioned that the, the unprotected uh, sections of the message, which are not signed within DNSSEC, I consider that a feature, not a bug. Um, so that doesn't really need a solution here in my opinion. Um, also, let's not lose the, the overall picture out of sight here. So we have a couple of methods already addressed uh, in terms of transition mechanisms towards more DNSSEC deployment. We are transitioning more or less to TCP. I heard you disagree, but that's fine. Um, I am not really convinced that this is the point in time to actually adopt the draft. I think the, the suggestions you make uh, are, are um, reasonable and would work. I fear the complexity uh, that we add and the number of choices for operators and especially people who need to debug things. Um, so the thousand flowers bloom approach uh, is, is really great, but I fear complexity. And if I didn't say that, I fear complexity. So I would like uh, the chairs not to ask for adoption or at least have the mic in hand when, when I can hum. Um, this isn't really wrong, but not the right time. Thank you. Well, Peter, um, you're welcome to hum as you please, but we are going to ask for a hum on adoption. And with apologies, McClendon, that we had to, to slow you down. Um, but so for those, this does seem to have gotten a number of people review, reading it and a discussion in here. So there does seem to be interest. Um, those in favor of adopting, please hum now. Those in favor of considering a revised version based on the conversation so far and on the mailing list. Please hum now, thank you. Okay. Those opposed to working further on this document, please hum. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're not gonna adopt, but it sounds like we're gonna. No, we yeah. make decisions based on what happens in the room yeah. and on the mailing list. Yeah. Thank you for the input. Heard very little hum for adoption. Heard significantly more for further work and comment on the list and heard significantly more for leave it alone. I have no clicker. Mm. If there's any Jedi's in the room that want to advance the slides for me, I'd appreciate that. All right, and I will just turn my back to the audience here. Um, so I apparently am stuck with doing controversial things here at this meeting, as always. Um, so this is an idea that came to the list. Um, there's a draft about it that we submitted during the last ITF, which is, I know, a really bad timing. And cleverly, we didn't revise it before this ITF, which is also really bad planning. Uh, nevertheless, because of the work that mccoon has been doing on the checksum, we thought it's a good time to, to visit this. And the basic idea here is to do fragmentation at the DNS application layer instead of uh, at the IP layer. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, because we're really short on time, I'm not going to go through the problem statement. Um, yeah, next slide, please, because I want to just get to the quick overview of the protocol. Um, so it's, it's very, very straightforward, basically what you'd expect. The, the resolve, in this case, in order to it, signal that you will accept fragments, the resolver puts an EDNS zero packet, uh, saying that if the authority server discovers that an answer is bigger than whatever limits you would have for wanting to fragment, 
um, then it will do this fragmentation. And what fragmentation means is that we make separate DNS messages for each part of the original answer. Um, and the way it's done is, is a very straightforward uh, implementation of what you'd expect. You list the total number of fragments that the receiver should expect, and then each one has a separate ID, which we just increase. Um, and the, the headers of each of these separate messages is identical to what the original big answer is, except for the, uh, the counts of, of the different sections. Um, and each, each uh, separate message has its own name, compression. Uh, the, the reason that we do it this way is so that we can look a lot like an existing DNS message. It should go through firewalls and all existing parsers and things should handle it without modification. Um, and then, so that's how we construct it. When the receiver gets these fragments, it sees that there's this new EDNS zero option saying that this is part of a larger fragmented set. It collects them all into the original unfragmented answer and then processes that as it would normally. That's, that's the whole protocol. Next slide. Uh, there's a whole bunch of edge cases and details. So if you aren't aware of it, in the deprived list, there was a, a proposal added to the DNS over DTLS, which is the datagram version of TLS, in order to do fragmentation in that. The, their motivation was that because when you add crypto, you expand your package, so there's going to be lots of fragmentation. They wanted to do this fragmentation in that. Um, this is a more general way. I actually pushed back against that other implementation because they hadn't gone into depth for all the corner cases of which there are many. And this is just a sample of them. Um, we have to specify how DNSSEC validation is done. You do it on the whole answer. Um, we have to look at how we deal with amplification. Um, we did some analysis, and I'm pretty sure that will be, there will definitely be a small increase in the size versus uh, IP layer fragmentation. Uh, because you're fragmenting relatively large packets, I don't expect it to be great. Um, we haven't done strict analysis, but my, my hand wavy argument is at about 5 or 10% growth. Um, and, you know, do we need some way to prevent amplification? Should we recommend or require cookies? Should we recommend or require something like RRL? We don't know yet. This is a zero, zero draft. Um, we also need to specify a limit on the number of packets. Uh, we don't expect if you break it up into 10 different uh, frag fragments that this makes any sense. At that point, you're better to just truncate and ask people to move to TCP. Um, and that limitation is both for reliability and for congestion on the network reasons. Next slide, please. Um, and we do have a kind of thing that's kind of clever, which is that we have a kind of staggering in the response size. Um, we go through a number of predefined packet sizes, which we expect the very smallest will always get through any kind of um, network. And then the next, the next in steps are based on expected uh, working MTU sizes. And so this way, as a resolver, if you see the first but not any subsequent fragments, you have a good reason to guess that there's some middle, middleware doing uh, horrible things in the way. And in the future, you can signal that to the authority side to only get the smaller size to eliminate any drop packets in the future. Um, and that's it, I think. Next slide. So in addition to all these kind of corner cases, which we're still hammering out, there's a number of open issues. We want to put a more detailed section describing resolver behavior. Um, we need to figure out the TSIG story, if there is any. Um, we need to document very clearly how you, if you are able to split RR, uh, RR sets or not. Um, usually we find that a horrible thing to do in the DNS. But in this case, for efficiency reasons, it might make sense to split on in the middle of an R set, as long as the final answer combines them properly. Um, and we also want to be more clear about recommendations about when not to fragment. And I think that's it. Next slide. Yep. Yeah, that that's was it. it. And I know you're not asking for adoption at this time, as we're going to get more reviews on it, I think it, it needs. Yeah, well, I think what we'll do is um, spin it to a zero one revision and then ask for adoption yep. at that time. Andre Suri Sizanik. Shane, you missed the one thing from amplification is the number of the packets. Because if you query for any and set the low, um, low size of the fragment, then you will get much more packets on the receiving end. And that's the problem, not the, not the size that's increase, true. That's true. But, but the number well, of the packets. Uh, yeah, that is true. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So is this a what comment, I, yeah, what I comment think coming to the microphone before I sit down for this draft? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Are you going to the microphone? 
my point on the previous discussion was I'm hearing in this working group and others lots of talk about fragmenting and reassembling UDP to avoid the TCP three-way handshake. My comment, I'm Stuart Chesh from Apple, is we are increasingly using TCP fast open. And in fact, my colleague from Apple right now in this time slot is giving a presentation in TCPM about our experiences using TCP fast open. And I, it, I, it's odd to me that I'm hearing all this discussion as if TCP fast open didn't exist when it does mitigate one of these round trips setting up TCP. Thank you. That that sounds like good input to, to yeah, we, to the we'll, list. I think we'll discuss the TCP fast open on the list. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, and Dwayne. So I, I wish my presentation was about why UDP DNS needs reliable and ordered delivery of messages, but that's not what this is about. This is about something else. So this is the EDNS key tag option. Do you have a clicker for me? No, it Somebody stole it? Yeah, All right. It All right. Um, <clears throat> it's okay if you do. Oh, there he is. <laughs> oh, did you? All right. Mm. No, that's the other one. So anyway, all right, that's fine. Okay. So this draft uh, is written to address um, a, a sort of a specific problem. You may have heard that um, people are talking about doing a rollover of the root zone KSK. And so we have RFC 5011, which will help greatly with that. Um, but there's some difficulty in measuring uh, RFC 5011's um, sort of whether, whether it's working or not. It's very difficult to externally measure whether uh, whether the recursive name servers have picked up and are using the new trust anchor. No, this doesn't work. Oh, that doesn't work? No. It doesn't, it doesn't okay. seem to. <laughs> no, that was me. So uh, if, if, if you don't know, uh, you, you probably do, but if you don't, validators, DNSSEC validators, have things called trust anchors. And this is what a trust anchor looks like big blob. Um, if you sort of ask software nicely, you can get, you can tell, uh, tell it to print DNS keys with a key tag ID, which is the uh, bit that's underlined in red there. So uh, trust anchors or more specifically DNS keys and DS records have uh, key tags, which is a 16 bit value. Next please. So this proposal is that validators, i.e. clients should uh, transmit their trust anchor key tags in queries towards authoritative name servers. And those authoritative name servers can then collect and analyze the key tags to monitor the progress of rollovers. This draft is very uh, strongly modeled after RFC 6975, which uh, signals cryptographic algorithm uh, understanding in, in uh, validators. Next, please. Um, briefly, this is just what the option, the proposed option format looks like, code length, and then a list of 16-bit uh, key tag values. Next, please. So I'm going too fast. <laughs> um, so when to send? When, when would a validator or a client send a, a EDNS key tag? Uh, you would send it potentially either in stub or recursive mode. You would send it for queries only. Uh, you would send it only for query type of DNS key. And the document currently says that you should send it for uh, configured trust anchor and that you may send it for cached DS records, um, but you must not send it otherwise. <clears throat> One tricky part is uh, forwarding of this option. So you may have a validating stub sending queries to a validating recursive. And in that case, they may have different uh, key tag values. And currently the draft says that those values should be combined in a way uh, that's defined as a union. Uh, the, 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 the recursive should send the union of the key tag values onto the authoritative. Uh, it has also been proposed on the list that maybe intersection would be a better choice for that. A few privacy concerns with this idea. Um, key tags could be used for fingerprinting, especially if the validator has other trust anchors than, say, just the root zone trust anchor. So 
one way to address that is, is the document says uh, it's not required to send this option in every query. You could send it for some, you know, uh, some fixed number of, or some fixed uh, ratio of queries, or you can send it with some probability. And you're not required to send it for every trust anchor. Uh, you could be manually configured to only send it for specific zones, for example. Next, please. Uh, obviously, the, the key tag values can be faked. Uh, and so the, um, the consumer of the key tag data uh, needs to be aware that it's possible that someone is out there trying to do something tricky and send wrong uh, key tag values in order to maybe delay the progress of a, ro of a rollover. Um, <clears throat> there was a possibility that the key tag values could identify uh, a validator that has failed to properly roll over to a new key and is maybe using an old, possibly compromised key. Um, and there's also the possibility that uh, of key tag collisions because it's only a 16-bit value. And so the document says something like, um, you know, anyone who's relying on this mechanism would probably want to take measures to make sure that they don't have two keys with the same key tag value in their zone. Next. So um, that's it. If you haven't reviewed it, please review. and. Um, like to ask the working group for adoption and yes, we, take questions. Can we get a show of hands of who has read this? Oh, okay. And then we can do the questions. Sure, thanks. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm Jabber scribing at the same time while conveying Jeb comments to the microphone here. Uh, so Mark Andrews has two, uh, two comments from the Jabber room. The first is that he says you should send multiple per set and don't merge, although I'm not sure exactly in what context he's talking about. So um. Um, so I, I guess he's, he's suggesting that there should be, uh, instead of one option with, with a long list, maybe multiple instances of the option with, with separate yeah. lists. I, 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 yeah. Um, and his next, he also has uh, another comment which says that you need, also need time windows to be defined. Mm -hmm. I'll have to follow up with him. I don't know what that means. Um, okay. Well, maybe he'll clarify and I'll go to the back of the line. Okay. I have a third comment from the microphone and I apologize. Uh, this is from Evan Hunt who says, if the goal here is strictly to, to provide telemetry about 5011 rollover progress, then there's a simpler approach in draft Kamari DNS op trust management 01, of which he is the co-author. Um, if the goal is broader than that, and then, then he's not sure what the additional goals may be. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what, what uh, Evan means exactly by 5011 rollover, but uh, I can follow up with him on that. Okay. Mike line is closed. Thanks. Uh, Andre Suris, uh, Nick. Jane, um, just a clarification. If I have two stub resolvers sending uh, different key tags to one full resolver, do I send query to the for let's say root for each of those, even if it's already in cache. So does the cache information uh, has the key tag option attached to, do you, do you understand what I'm asking? So if, if, you're, a, if you're a stub and, and you're sending this to a resolver, yeah, the resolver I, I, would only forward it in the case of a cache miss. Yes, and then this cache, and then there's second stub with a different key tag. Right. Then it then it would not it would not be seen. It would not be forwarded at, at that time. Okay. The assumption is that you it know maybe the next time it expires, tag. that client would 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 be the first one or or whatever. So yeah. Paul Vargas, what is the reasoning for uh, making a difference between DS records and cached DS records? Because that scares me a little bit. Because if it's cached and I have different behavior, then I'm basically telling you when my DS record is or is about to expire, which would actually make it really nice for a targeted attack. Um, so I, I put the word cached in there because uh, I, I'm thinking that the, the, the cache, the, the validating recursive, can only transmit this option if it already knows what, what the trust anchor is for the response that, it, that it's going to receive. So if, if, it, if it doesn't have the DS record yet, it, it can't transmit its, its key tag. Right? Oh, I see, of course. So that, that's why I put cached in there. Um, and and, I, and I, I, I put the bit about 
DS records in there just to make it more applicably gen generally applicable to other than just the root zone. Right. But you know, if 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 the group says this should only apply to the root zone, you know, that that that's fine too. I, it doesn't matter well, to me too much. Yeah. So and that was my second question. I know I actually pushed you to make it for more than just the root zone, and now I'm thinking while you presented this, like. If if I have a hard coded trust anchor, do I really want to sort of announce that capability either? Like right. w I would never update it anyway because it's hard coded. Right. So you don't have to. I mean, you can tell your software, you know, only send this option for the root zone, or only send it for my uh, specific trust anchor zone. Right. So it's it's not required to send in every in every case in every query. Right. George from AP Nick, I really like this. Um, done some ways, this would become a de facto mechanism to measure at least the length of the chain of players in the DNS query for those who implemented support for this option, which would give us information we do not otherwise have. So when Mark asks, are you doing it just for the key role? I'd say you might be doing it just for the key role, but the information you get is material and interesting. So I like the idea of the join of the participants along the wire and growing some sense from that length. How long is the chain of active players between the client's question and the authority? I like that part. That's one part. The second part is, actually, I forgot what the second part was, but I like it. <laughs> so, hey, Lewis, I just want to say, I'd like to see this adopted because I, I have some ideas all float in text, but I think it's worth adopting for the working group. Thanks. I'd, I'd like uh, Mark Andrews has given a clarification about what he meant by time windows. He says to get counts, you need time windows for how long to hold learned data, and it needs to be the same by all impl implementations. And he suggests 24 hours. I remembered my second part. Is that breaking the line? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, since a lot of people have read the document, um, oh. So I know what you were about to do, but one of the comments was about another draft that has a lot of overlap with this, which hasn't been called for a hum. Just wanted to bring that up. I saw that in the IRC in the Jabber logs, yes. And so, so we can, and that can be addressed even after the thing is adopt, uh, adopted as well, if it is adopted. So since this one has had a lot of people reading it, um, but if we can get a hum of the room, if people feel that this draft should be adopted and worked on in the working group, please hum now. And if you think this draft should not be adopted at this time, uh, please hum now. Okay. Make note that silence is, yep, so thank you, Dwayne. Uh, cool. And just a couple of short ones. I think we're actually doing okay on time, surprisingly enough. Um, I will be fast, don't worry. Uh, so, Stefan Bortsmeyer, uh, this is just um, two uh, wild ideas that I had, and I wanted, before I do, I actually start to work on it, to have an idea of the opinion of the working group about it. One was raised during the DNS Yeti meeting in, on Saturday, uh, that you know that we have RFC 7735, which uh, creates a redirection to the new AS112 with uh, D name. And then we have, uh, maybe you've heard about the special uh, use domain name registry. Uh, well, there are some name in it, which receive a lot of traffic at the root, which is completely useless, typically dot local. It's a second or third, I don't remember, second or third TLD in the root, which is useless and should be handled by a sync all like AS112. So the problem is that it requires to change things in the root. If you want to put a DNAME for dot .local to the AS112 in the root, you need a lot of process. And it's possible that some organization will try to, to uh, send back and forth the uh, ball and saying, this should be done by the IETF, no, it should be done by ICANN, etc. So uh, IETF could, in theory, said, 
uh, that a TLD in the special use uh, domain name registry should receive a D name in the root to be redirected to the sync code of AS112. I, it doesn't mean that it will be implemented uh, by ICANN uh, for the many political reasons, but maybe technically it will make sense. So of, uh, I suggested to do it only for the special use domain name registry because then there are less political problems. So the domains which are very talkative like .om or .belkin, one which are not in the special use uh, domain name registry would be left out. But if we had uh, a RFC saying that uh, TLD in uh, this uh, special use uh, domain name registry are to be handled by a denim in the wood. It could be useful, for instance, for experiments like uh, Yeti. Yeti uh, keep uh, the serving only the official wood, not a new one. So it's actually to make a modification, even for this sort of domain. It would be easier if we had such a document. So do you think it's uh, possibly a good idea and I should start to write? A draft on it, or is it a completely stupid idea? And should I do something else, such as going to uh, meetings or uh, organ concerts or things like that? Um, Peter Koch, Stefan, I think this is possibly a very good idea, and you should still go to organ concerts. Um, so we have we have this document that suggests we that that explains to people how to run their own instance of the root zone to have instant negative responses for the, these cases. Entering a D name in the root actually then directs those questions to some really existing name servers. How would that be compatible with more privacy by the limitation of leakage of DNS queries? Well, if the request uh, gets to the root name servers, privacy is already compromised, so it no, changes nothing. It, it, it goes to your system, and your system would have a copy uh, of the In the root. case where you use a loopback? Uh, exactly. Okay. Wow. Good question. Uh, this is a, a comment from the Jabber Room. Olafur Goodmanson says, start writing. <laughs> 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 oh, oh boy. Fire up your organ. This is toxic. <laughs> and that was Andrew. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What else we got? Okay. So I, w I won't uh, ask adoption by the working group immediately. <laughs> Second one is, in my opinion, more important. Uh, it's uh, the idea of. Uh, Clarification, what is a NX domain, especially for ENT, MT non-terminals, but not only. Uh, it's the idea that maybe you've read this draft. How many people have read this draft? It's an old one. It's expired now. Okay. So uh, one of the problems of this, this draft never gained any traction. Part of the reason was in the draft there were several improvements to resolvers, and not everybody agreed with all the uh, proposal. So it was difficult to gather a consensus on the entire draft. I will focus only on section three of the draft, which is called stopping downward cache search on NX domain. My idea was to uh, cut the text and publish it in a draft with just section three. What it does it say? Basically, domain names are, you know, as are organized in a tree which means that if bar.example does not exist, then foo.bar.example does not exist, period. It cannot exist because if there is an NX domain, it, it takes down everything which is under it. So the idea is to treat an NX domain for a node as an NX domain for every node under it, which means that a resolver, for instance, when it knows that bar.example does not exist, it knows it because it received an NX domain, it can immediately reply to any query for uh, foo.bar.example with an NX domain. In my opinion, it's obvious for the very definition of the DNS as a tree of domain names, but apparently it's not obvious for everyone for good and bad reasons, so it would be a good idea to um, make things very clear. 
Why is it important? It's important for QNAME minimization, and it's important also in some case of random QNAME attacks, because today you cannot uh, prevent these attacks just by uh, feeding the resolver with the NX domain for, uh, for the domain used for the attack, because the resolver will not trust it and will continue to ask him to the authoritative name server. So, uh, of course, it means also that NX domain for ENT is wrong. It's, I think we all, all know that, but it would be better to have it clearly in writing. So, good or stupid idea, as before, should we try to do uh, RFC just for this point, or should we try to update another document or maybe uh, wait until RFC uh, 1034 bis? That's, sorry, that's the end. So, let's go. Paul okay, Vargas. Um, so I think it's a very dangerous idea. Um, like, uh, there's cases, one, there's the DNS, where I have a hard-coded domain that, that is technically a subdomain of something above it, even though it comes from a different spot. So you, you kill that with your annex domain proposal. So if I have, like, paulhome.reta.com or something, and, and something goes, goes wrong with reta.com, you're killing my home domain. And in that same context, um, let's say the, uh, the, we're rolling the root key and something goes bad, and there's a resolver with an old trust key, and you're saying that the root now fails, then I would really not want to have my local domain taken down and shot as well. So um, You mean the root can fail? Of course it can have a self fail or something like that, but how would it... But the idea of a root sending spurious NX domain seems a bit far-fetched. You think oh, yeah, I, guess, I guess you're right. I guess it's not an NX domain. No. Yeah, okay, never mind then. Yeah, you're right. But your first point, uh, stand. Yeah. Hey, Lewis, um, the one problem with assuming that the lower name doesn't exist is things do change on the authoritative side, if that's what you're worried about. It might be that when I asked for this name, it wasn't there. I asked five minutes later, and someone's filled up the tree, so it might be there now. So um, I, it's not always true that this, you know, you might have cached this is not there, but it turns out this is there now, because we have time going by. Yeah, but the NX domain for the above domain has a TTL. So as long as the TTL is not no, elapsed, whether you, it's whether true. You, it's whether you want to capture that. Uh, Andrew Sullivan, I, yeah, you you should write this. You should write it as a separate or a, um, a separate internet draft for exactly the reason that you think um, it failed the last time. And I will enthusiastically review this. I think it's a great idea. I'm John Levine. I know of one widely used DNS server that gets this wrong, which is RBL DNSD. I think you should write it because then I can persuade him to fix it. You know, yeah, it's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Hello, Stefan. Oh, You're right. Uh, Giovanni Mores again. Oh, I'm sorry. Shimon, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, hello, Stefan. So I, I just wanted to clarify something uh, you said in your slide earlier. Annex domain actually does mean annex domain for the iterative resolution algorithm. And I'm not aware that there's any controversy about that. What, what Vixie's draft is trying to do is redefining, redefine the meaning of NX domain for negative caching specifically. Okay, that's my first comment. Uh, my second comment is that, yes, I support this draft. I've said so uh, publicly and on the list. I think it would be a great idea. Um, it would be nice if the original negative caching spec had said this from the beginning. My understanding from speaking to Mark Andrews was the reason they decided not to do it was because it made uh, the resolver's job harder in producing uh, negative answers, uh, NSEC and NSEC tree records for names underneath the NX domain boundary. So that's a topic that the Vixie draft does not discuss now. So. Uh, uh, I agree with, with Andrew, you should split it out into a separate draft, but you need to discuss, we need to outline very um, uh, specifically how resolvers behave to produce uh, authenticated denial of uh, existence answers for names underneath the annex domain boundary. One possible solution would be to say that the resolver, when it has a cache NX domain, mm -hmm. should, capital should, mm -hmm. send an NX domain for every name underneath. Right. And if it doesn't, if the resolver doesn't do it, 
it will be only a performance problem because it will eat the authoritative name servers, but it won't change the final answer, with, which will still be an NX domain. Sure. Would it address your concern? Um, uh, possibly. I'll have to think it through a little bit. Um, and one final comment. So as, as recent experiments with QNAME minimization have already revealed, uh, deploying this is going to have some, you know, there, there are going to be some practical deployment challenges with this, right? So that's something that we certainly need to consider. I mean, obviously, we don't want to put work around, protocol workarounds in a protocol document, but as a practical matter, we need to think about these things. Yeah, one more and we're done. Uh, yeah, so Giovanni Morris at the end, labs. And tagging along with the measurement thing, like uh, measurement engineering protocols, uh, after all, our website made available statistics about queries we see on the data nail zone. We see mostly every day we see more NX domains than anything else there. So I'd be curious to see how that would impact, it definitely would reduce the traffic, would observe that's just garbage basically. So it sounds like you have some writing to do, Stefan. So get busy. Um, thanks. So, and I think that's basically we've all wrapped up what's going on. Um, we've got some stuff. It looks like the group's going to adopt, so we have some work going forward. We've that as we cleaned off our plate, we have more things to add to the plate. Um, yeah, just it, it always happens. Um, but I think you know we're we're in much better shape. So any yeah, just please don't forget to sign the blue sheet. Thanks everybody, um, and we will be um, making sure that we get back to the list with. Uh, the outcomes from these discussions. Please send reviews. Please uh, follow up on the, the discussions here on the list. Thanks, everybody. I like one. I, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah.